what I wanted to share with the body of Christ tonight, I think that uh, a lot of believers uh, have a desire to walk with the Lord. And guys, but they don't really know exactly what to do or how to do it. And there are some essential things that over the many years that I've walked with Christ that I, I know are essential to your walk with the Lord. And one is knowing the voice of God, knowing the will of God, and understanding how God speaks to you. Uh, one of the things that we teach, and I think it's a very important thing for all of the people that we deal with, and I shared, I call it obedience is the safety net for the believer. The very act of obedience moves the hand of God in a very powerful way. And tonight, guys, we're going to get in a little bit of talking about how to hear and know the voice of God in your own personal walk with the Lord. Uh, one of the things that you have to realize, though, is your pastor, David Rosales, or your teachers can give you great teaching but unless you're willing to apply it to your life, it really does not matter. And one of the things that we have to do is have a heart that's willing to listen to the Lord and allow the Lord to speak to our hearts. You know, guys, uh, I've been in the southern Sudan now for 26 years. Uh, our ministry is now operating in 38 different countries around the world. And uh, we have about 1,000 missionaries and chaplains that are supported by our organization 100% around the world. And to put that in perspective, you know, if you are a missionary in Afghanistan or Pakistan and you're making a salary of $300 a month, that's considered a very good salary. So these are the type of people that we have on the mission field. Uh, it's about the same, maybe around a couple hundred dollars for chaplains in the South Sudan Army. Uh, but over the years, uh, the Lord has really expanded the ministry. And I really tell people... People, people will often come up and say, how did you guys grow so fast? Uh, how were you able to do this? And I tell them it was obedience, just obeying the voice of the Lord. And guys, you don't understand sometimes how the smallest areas of obedience can radically change your life. You know, uh, before being in uh, South Sudan for 26 years, I was in Russia for five years. And Russia was always the first love. You know, I had prayed for the former Soviet Union for 13 years before God actually sent me over there. And I'd spent five years in Russia traveling and preaching the gospel all across the nation. And it was one of the greatest times of my life. And I'll never forget that when I was traveling, I would take teams into Russian prisons. And uh, it was very open for the gospel back then. I mean, it, we would go into a city and have a theater and it, there would not be a single seat open in the theater. You know, you hear these stories about where well, you'd set up a street meeting and uh, over 2,000 people would show up and people say, was that really true? Well, I was there. It was true. I remember going into one city and we were doing an outreach in a prison and uh, I got back that evening and there were about seven, eight, nine young boys outside of what was supposed to be our hotel. It really wasn't a hotel, but it was the best they had. And I remember them saying to me, we hear that you're doing uh, a play in the prison. I said, yes, we are. They go, will you do it for us? I said, well, guys, we can't do it tonight. Uh, it, we're going to go out tomorrow. When we get back, tell your buddies and friends, and we will do this play for you. Now, I think probably the oldest kid there might have been 11, probably more about the age of nine. But by the time we got back, there were over 2,000 people waiting for us. And that's what happened back then in the early days of when the Soviet Union collapsed. But guys, the Lord has taught me over the years that often he'll speak to us about things that we're supposed to do. But if we don't listen to him, we won't know the fruit of that. And I think one of the greatest lessons that God ever taught me in my life was uh, when I was in Russia, uh, I would take teams into the prisons and I would have I remember I had a young girl that was on several of my teams. I think she went on three different outreaches over the course of a year with me. And after the third outreach, she asked if she could sit down and talk to me. And I said, of course. And I thought maybe she wanted to talk about missions or being a missionary or giving uh, because that's what people did. You know, they would get uh, affected by what they saw and they'd want to talk about that. And I sat down with her and I asked her what she wanted. And she said, you know, Wes, if God would ever want me to be more than a sister to you someday, she goes, I would really like that. And guys, I, I, I was utterly stunned when she said this to me. One, uh, she was about 10 years younger than me. Uh, she was a tiny, petite little thing. I've always been a big lug of a guy, you know. And uh, her testimony was she was into chocolate chip cookies and swing sets. And at the age of six, she decided to give up that reckless life of sin and turn her life over to Christ. And uh, so she had a very innocent life. She told me she had never been with anyone. And uh, at first, I really thought that I was going to marry this girl. And uh, she was a wonderful Christian woman, very, very sweet, had a real heart for the Lord. But as I prayed and I sought the Lord, the Lord really spoke very clearly to me. And he said, you're not to marry this woman. And, and uh, she told me she had backslid once in her life and smoked a cigarette. And, uh, you know, uh, 
And so I said, Lord, I think we can move past that cigarette thing and go ahead with this relationship. And the Lord said, you know, Wes, you're not to marry this girl. And I remember the day that I told her, guys, it was a very difficult conversation because she broke down and she started to cry. And there was just nothing I could do to fix it. You know, I couldn't say, the Lord actually really spoke very clear to me. He says, don't tell her you're going to pray about it. You know, don't, don't leave a road to come back to you. You need to cut this off right now. And, uh, you know, there was just a point I had to say to her, you're going to make somebody an incredible wife. Unfortunately, it's not going to be me. And I don't want you to think that I don't care about you because I do care about you. But I know the voice of the Lord, and the Lord has told me that we're going in different directions. You can't see it now, and I can't see it, but in the future we will see it. And that was the impression the Lord had given me. Well, guys, uh, probably about six months to a year later, God called me to the southern Sudan. And uh, the ministry has now been around going on its 24th year. Uh, I've been in Sudan for 26, but it was about two years after I got there that we started the ministry. Uh, over the last uh, 24 years, we are an extremely large organization. Uh, we have built two castles in Africa. One is a school for children. And the reason for the castles is because you have Islamic terrorism and you have to have a fortified fortress to protect people. The other one is the chaplain's training base. Both can hold about 700 people on them. They can actually live there, eat there, and go to school there. And, uh, you know, right now we're feeding 15,000 people a month in the Ukraine. Uh, we're building 100 homes. We've got about 70 of them done. Uh, and uh, we have works in Mexico. Uh, last year we built probably about a dozen homes for women that have either been abandoned or abused for them and their children. Uh, and many, many more works. We're planting churches all over the world. But maybe about six months to a year after I got into the South Sudan, this young girl called me on the phone. And she goes, Wes, I need to say something to you. She said, when you were a missionary in Russia, I would have loved to have been your wife. But when I heard that you were called to the Southern Sudan, she said, I had a real fear in my heart. She goes, I knew the way that God made you, and I knew that he made you for something like this. And she goes, I have to be completely honest. I could have never handled being your wife in the Southern Sudan. And guys, I think about the fact that had I been disobedient and not obeyed the Lord, would I ever have known what I missed? All the ministry that's taken a place around the world. And uh, it's interesting because I met my wife, Vicki, in Africa. And uh, Vicki has been an absolute tremendous helpmate to me. People find it very hard to believe. But in all the years that we have been married, we've never had a serious argument. I mean, all couples are going to disagree and they're going to argue. But we've never had one of those knockdown, drag out arguments. And the reason why is because both of our hearts are set upon ministry. There's not a day that goes by that my wife doesn't tell me four or five times how much she loves me. And she is an absolutely a, a fanatical student of the word. Uh, uh, she just came off the field after 23 years of serving in the South Sudan uh, with all the work exploding around the world. Uh, she felt it was time to come home and help in other areas. And at the time, she had 13 women's Bible studies going a week. Every single study was a different study. I would say, Vicki, why don't you teach the same one? You've got 13 different groups of women. They haven't heard it. And she goes, no, that's not the way the Lord. So she's in the Word about seven, eight hours a day. And guys, um, I really know what it means to have a tremendous helpmate. Now, the other girl probably would have been a wonderful wife and probably been a wonderful helpmate but she wasn't designed to serve where I was at. And had I disobeyed the Lord, I would have never known. Another situation that happened to me many years ago was uh, before we started Far Reaching Ministries, I worked for another mission organization. It was called Safe Harbor, run by Pastor De uh, Gary Kuzanoki. And guys, uh, my job in the early days of the ministry, uh, Sudan was a very radical war zone. And uh, because of my military background, they would fly me into the bush about two weeks before pastors and doctors would go in. And they would drop me into the bush, and I would go out, and I would do a reconnaissance of the area. I'd find out where the enemy was, how many of them there was, what their troop strength was, what the danger element to our people was. When I knew it was safe, I would radio out and tell them to me bring in uh, the main body of the team, and then I would continue to run patrols to make sure that we did not get attacked while we were on the ground. And uh, one of the times I was over there, I came down with a case of malaria, and it wasn't overly severe, but I've probably had malaria between 35 and 40 different times. Uh, three times it's put me in ICU, 
and almost killed me. And, uh, but, you know, I, I had malaria and I wanted to go home. I was very tired. You know, Sudan is an extremely hot country. It's not only hot, it's extremely humid. And you, you know, uh, you sleep out of exhaustion. You don't fall asleep feeling comfortable. You literally sweat all night long. And I hated being in there. And uh, you know, when you're in the Sudan and you're among the tribes, uh, sometimes they bring you food that's cooked and dead, and sometimes they bring you food that's not dead. And uh, I remember one night they brought us a basket of live bugs for dinner. And I know that God speaks to people because I was with five Calvary Chapel pastors and every one of them told me that God told them they were supposed to pray and fast that evening, you know. <laughs> so God really does speak to people. And I prayed about it and I said, Lord, do you want me to pray and fast? And the Lord said, no, I want you to eat the bugs. And, uh, you know, you pick, they, they're called flying ants, but you, they look like kind of like the wings of a dragonfly. You pick them up and you pluck the wings off and you put them in your mouth and they kind of walk around inside, you know. And you bite down on them, and they're kind of crunchy on the outside and chewy on the inside, and they don't taste anything like chicken at all, you know. And uh, But I'd, I'd come out of the Sudan, and uh, I had malaria, and I wanted to go home, guys. I really did. All I wanted was clean sheets. I wanted uh, something that was cold, like a cold Coca-Cola, and something that resembled American food. And uh, I remember that uh, when I got into uh, Nairobi, Kenya, to our guest house, uh, the water heater was broken, so we had no water for hot showers. We had no water for clean sheets. And, uh, and, and I, I had a brother coming in by the name of Bill Ages. Bill served with us in those days, and Bill knew my job. And so I was going to go, and I was going to ask Bill, would you mind finishing the last two weeks for me? And, uh, and I started to do that, but the Lord told me to go and read the book of Colossians, and I read the book of Colossians. I get to the second to last verse, and it says, tell Archippus to finish the work for which the Lord has sent him to do. And guys, when I read that verse, it came off the pages, and I knew what the Lord was saying. He's saying, don't leave, finish this work. Well, on the trip, uh, because of my security thing, uh, they flew in four men uh, from America. And, you know, my job was to make sure that we knew how to get them out in case we got attacked. And, uh, one day, uh, they told me to take these four guys and uh, fly to the city of Ye. Ye was under siege by the Northern Army, and they wanted to get video and testimony and then bring it back and hopefully get it on the news stations to tell the world what was happening in the southern Sudan. And uh, as we were flying towards the city of Ye, um, the navigator came back, and he said, they're bombing the city as we're coming in. We're going to turn around and fly to Lokichokio. Now, Lokichokio was in northern Kenya. And, and for those of you who saw the movie Lion King when you were young or you watched it with your children, if you remember seeing Pride Rock, that's actually Loki, Tokyo, Kenya. It really exists. But there's a big UN base there, and, you know, they have these nice tents. They have hot showers. They have a buffet every night. They have clean sheets, and they actually have a fan in your room so you can kind of keep cool at night. And I was actually pretty excited about the fact that at least I was going to get a hot shower and get my clothes washed. And as when we flew in and landed, um, one of the brothers that was on the team, and they'd given me a briefing about this guy, and I remember what they actually said to me. They go, they were kind of telling me about each person, and they got to this guy, and they said, well, he's kind of a computer nerd, which I didn't know exactly what that was supposed to mean, you know. And so when we landed, he came up to me, and he said, Wes, can I room with you tonight? Because we had to have two men to attempt. And in all honesty, guys, I really did not want to room with this guy. I wanted to be able to uh, be alone with Michael. Michael was a Sudanese brother. In the early days of being in Africa, Michael and I went all across the Sudan together, up mountains, down mountains. We got shot at. We got bombed together. We ran into crocodiles. We ran into lions. We, we did everything together. We were good friends. And, uh, but I felt like I had to be polite, and I kind of go, yeah, you can room with me. Well, guys, something had happened just before we got there. Um, I'd had a guy come in one day, and uh, he asked me to come and share with the soldiers, and I did. And we went out and we shared. And I won't get into the story. It's a long story. But we led about 150 so uh, South Sudanese soldiers to the Lord. And uh, I'd gone to the mission director, and I said, I know what's the problem with this country. They do not have a moral compass. So I said, we need to start a chaplaincy so we can train the soldiers how to fight. Because 
what the Arabs are doing to them, they're doing right back to the Arabs. You know, they're doing all the atrocities, and we need to make them understand that fighting and killing is a part of warfare, but murder, rape, pillaging, and plundering is not. And they had said to me, they go, Wes, we do not feel led to work with the military. If you want to work with the military, you have to leave our organization. And, you know, guys, we left on good terms. I said, guys, I'm not against you. I love you. This isn't a split for the sake of having a split, but I really feel like the Lord is telling me that I'm supposed to start a chaplaincy program. Well, when I got in the tent with this night, that guy, you know, guys, we stayed up to probably midnight talking. We had a lot in common, uh, actually much more than I thought. Nothing about computers, but other areas we had a lot in common. And around midnight, he says, Wes, do you know anything about my life? And I said, well, I know you're into computers. He goes, no, not that. He goes, I was in investments, and I retired at the age of 40. He goes, I would like to write a check for you and your children for 20000 American dollars. Now, guys, when he said that to me, I, I didn't know what to say at first. And I looked at him. I said, brother, I need to say something to you. I said, there's a lot of myth about my name. I said, uh, you know, people call me Crocodile Dundee and Indiana Jones, and I said, there's no truth in it. I said, at the time, I said, I'm a 40-year-old man, and I'm probably 40 years old, overweight, and I call this my hope chest. Someday I hope it'll be my chest. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, I want you to go home, and I want you to pray about it. And if the Lord tells you that you made a mistake, then don't even call me. Just don't send the check. And guys, one of the things that's really important a lot of Christians I've noticed manipulate things. They go out there and tell people their needs in the hope of getting something. Well, if you do that, you'll never know if it's the Lord. And I, and I needed to know it was the Lord. Well, right after that had happened, we'd had that talk about I had to leave the ministry. And I remember the when I got back to America, I was in my kitchen one day, and I was thinking about the fact that I had chose to leave them. And I thought to myself, what are you doing? how are you going to start a foreign mission organization? You don't even have enough money hardly to take care of yourself. These are the things that are going through my mind. And then I just said in my mind, I go, it's going to take at least $40,000 to get the mission off the ground. Now, guys, it would take far more money than that, but that was as big as I could think. Well, I get a call from this brother that night, and I hadn't talked to him for weeks. And he goes, I hear that you're having a dinner party at your house. I was inviting over some Calvary pastors. I said, yeah. He goes, do you mind if I come over and crash it? I said, no, come on over and crash it. And so we got out all the cowboy steaks, and we cut them in half and made cowgirl steaks out of them. And, you know, <laughs> guys don't like cowgirl steaks, but in a pinch, that's what you got to do because he brought over about an extra five people with him. And, guys, we had a great night of fellowship, but at the end of the night, as he was leaving, he handed me an envelope. And uh, when he handed me the envelope, you know, I thought he probably feels guilty for not giving me that $20,000. In my mind, I really thought there's probably $500 in there. I actually didn't open the envelope right away. And one of my friends goes, Wes, you better open that envelope. Well, I opened the envelope and there's three checks in there. One is written out to me for $20,000 American dollars, but there's two blank checks each for $20,000. And I thought, Lord, I prayed for $40,000 this morning and you've already provided it. I was so excited. The next morning I got up and I wrote Far Reaching Ministries on the checks and I went down and I deposited them. And right after I deposited them, this guy called me up. He said, um, you're probably wondering why I left the two checks blank. I said, well, I assume they're for the ministry. He goes, no, brother. He goes, this is if you want to send your kids to college someday. Uh, there's $20,000 for each of them. And I said, well, brother, I made a mistake. I said, I thought it was for the ministry. I've already deposited the money. He goes, well, don't worry about it. I'll just send you another $40,000. <laughs> and uh, about a month later, guys, he gave me a quarter of a million dollars. The next year, he gave me a half a million. And in the early stages of the ministry, the money that we needed, we got. Now, I think about the fact, had I got on that airplane and had I left and not listened to what the Lord had told me, I would have never known what I missed. And many of us were in a place in life that, Things aren't going well. We made decisions without trusting the Lord. We haven't listened to God's heart. And guys, I, I know there are people that are married and they're not happy in their marriage. And the, the solution isn't to get out of your marriage. That's not the solution. The solution is to obey the Lord, to seek God and ask him for wisdom about what to do. And when you seek the Lord, the Bible says, if you diligently seek me, 
you will find me. But it's not casually, it's not occasionally. The Bible says, if you diligently seek me, you will find me. And there's a real truth in that. And uh, I've learned over the years that when I don't know what to do, just to pray. And if I don't hear from the Lord, then I'm supposed to wait. You know, the Bible says, everything with supplication and prayer, make your petitions known to God. And the God of peace will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And so we seek the Lord for wisdom in what we're supposed to do. Now, guys, a part of knowing how to know the voice of the Lord is the Bible tells us, you know, in 1 Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 3, let me turn to that. We have the first instance of talking about hearing the voice of the Lord. And in verse 1, it says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of the Lord was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here am I. You called me. My son Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now, guys, this is the one instance where we have an audible voice of the Lord. I have walked with the Lord Jesus Christ for 46 years. I've never heard the audible voice of the Lord in 46 years, though I do tell people I know the voice of the Lord. I remember speaking up in Washington State a number of years ago, almost 20 years ago, and a woman came up to me afterwards. She said, you know, Wes, when you talk about hearing the voice of the Lord, you talk as though you hear the audible voice. She goes, I've walked with the Lord for 18 years, and I don't know that I know what the voice of the Lord is. Well, guys, there's a problem in that because the Bible says that my sheep know my voice. And a part of being belonging to God is we're actually supposed to know his voice. Now, there are many people that are born again that have not, do not know God's voice because they don't know how to seek him, but we need to learn how to do that. We have a second instance in King, uh, 1 Kings um, chapter uh, 19. Let me get to that, guys. In 1 Kings chapter 19, now guys, you have to read the two previous chapters to get to the story here, which we don't have time for tonight. But basically, in the two previous uh, chapters, God has not allowed rain to come on the land. And Elijah is told to go and present himself to the king, Ahab. And Ahab has searched for Elijah. He knows that because of Elijah's prayers, there's been no rain, and he wants, truthfully, he wants to kill Elijah. And so Elijah goes and he meets Ahab and, and, uh, and, and, and Ahab says, you know, you've been a trouble of Israel. And he goes, I am a troubled Israel. You've troubled Israel by following all your false gods. Well, what happens after that is they have a contest and, and Elijah says, let's do this. I will build uh, a, a, a fire and then you, you guys build a fire and then we'll cut up a bull. We'll put it on the fire. We'll put it on the, uh, the altar, I mean. And we'll call down fire from heaven, and the one who God answers will know is God. And that's exactly what they did. Well, of course, God brought fire down and burned up the altar, and then all 450 prophets of Baal were put to death. Now, the interesting thing about this story, guys, and you really need to go home and read the two chapters, like I said, we just don't have enough time to go over it tonight, was that Elijah just wiped out idolatry in Israel. But then Jezebel the queen, who is a great and wicked woman, sends a message to Elijah, and she says she's going to kill him. And all of a sudden, he becomes afraid. Now, if I had just prayed and asked the Lord to bring down fire from heaven to destroy 450 prophets of Baal, and someone contacted me and said, hey, I'm going to come and kill you, I'd say, trust me, there's more fire up there. You know? but, and you think this is what should happen, but what happens with Elijah, he becomes afraid. And guys, one of the things I've learned over the years in ministry uh, when we know how to deal with a battle in our skill set, we're very comfortable. But when we don't know how to do a battle because it's outside of our skill set, like one of the things that took me by surprise when I first became a missionary is that 
people would make up stories about me. I remember somebody went to my pastor of my home church and told him that, uh, I guess there's a movie out there called Lord of War about some guy that was smuggling arms into uh, all over the world. And he was telling my pastor this movie is based on Wes's life. So my pastor calls me into my, his office. He goes, I hear that you're smuggling weapons into South Sudan. I go, I go, you're right. He goes, what? He goes, what are you smuggling? I go, Bibles, you know. <laughs> and, but at first, I didn't know how to deal with it because people, were, I mean, just literally make it up lies. And it unnerved me a little bit. Now, other things that aren't my skill set don't unnerve me, but I had never dealt with that before. And I think that for Elijah, he just wasn't used to this. And in... Chapter 19, it said, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, say, May the gods deal with me ever so severely if by this time tomorrow I do not make you like one of them. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And it says, And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, guys, if the Lord comes to you and says, What are you doing here? It's a great time in your life to repent. But what most Christians do is we make up excuses for the situation we got ourselves into. And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a still, small, quiet voice or a gentle whisper. In my walk with the Lord, what I have learned of is that God speaks to the heart. He lays an impression upon your heart. In Jeremiah chapter 32, I believe, let me turn to it. Um, and I think this backs up very well what I'm talking about. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, Hanamo, son of Shalom, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field at Anath, because his nearest relative it is your right and duty to buy it. Then just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the garden and said, Buy my field at Anath in the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right to redeem and possess it, buy it for yourself. I knew that this was the word of the Lord, so I bought the field. Now, guys, what happened here, it seems very apparent that Jeremiah had an impression on his heart. Your uncle's going to come to you and say, buy my field. And then he says, and then my uncle came and said, buy my field. And he said, and I knew it was the word of the Lord. And in my own personal walk with the Lord, I found that's happened quite often, that God speaks to us very clearly through the word. Uh, in the early days of being in Sudan, uh, I'd come home from being in the field over the summertime, and guys, it gets really hot there. And I remember that when I came home, I called Gary Kuzanoki up. I said, Gary, I said, I've been in the Sudan for a long time. I'm tired. I'm, I'm worn out. You know, uh, I said, I don't want to go back for at least a couple months. And I was very clear about it. Well, the very next day, Gary called me on the phone. He said, hey, can you come down for a meeting? So I got in my car, and I drove down to meet with him. When I got down there, he said, I need you to go back to Sudan. And I looked at him, and I go, why do you need me to go back to Sudan, Gary? He said, the North has launched a massive offensive, and they've displaced thousands of people. There's a village called Tanj, and there's 9 to 12 people a day that are starving to death. And I need you to go back there and run operations. And I go, when do you want me to go? And he goes, today. I go, Gary, I can't go today. I said, I'll call you tomorrow. So I went home that night, guys, and I went to sleep, and the thought of going back there did not appeal to me at all. 
I next morning I got up and I went in my kitchen and I made a co- cup of coffee and I had my Bible closed and I was praying and as I was praying I just you know and I, I used these exact words I said Lord do you want me to go to your hungry and oppressed people I said you know how hot it is this time of year and you know how tired I am well at that moment I opened my Bible and my eyes fell to this verse and it says and if you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always and he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and he will strengthen your frame. Well, guys, you can't get much more of a direct answer than that. But at that moment, I heard somebody slide something under my front door. And I, and I went over and I looked and there was an envelope under my door. There was a young girl that used to come and interview me many, many, uh, over 25 years ago. Her name was Amanda Sash, very sweet Christian woman. And so I went over there and I picked up the envelope and I opened it. And inside there was a bookmarker with these exact two verses on it. Well, at that point, I knew it was the voice of the Lord. So I got on an airplane and I flew back to South Sudan. When I got there, I had to drive to, uh, to the city of Ye. And guys, uh, for at the time, you had to drive about five hours on what were semi-paved road. There was a lot of potholes, very difficult drive. And then you would hit a dirt road, and we used to call it the Badlands because when you would travel down these roads, there were destroyed vehicles everywhere. The, there was a group called the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, and they massacred people all the time out there. Well, I was looking for a guide to take me because I'd never gone up this road. And for three or four days, I'd look for a guide, and there was a brother by the name of John. He was a Ugandan pastor, and we could not find any. I was paying like two or three months' salary for uh, two weeks' work. Nobody would take it because it was too dangerous. And uh, so I finally said to John, I go, John, I said, uh, I'm leaving tomorrow. Whether you can find someone or not, I've got to leave. And I could tell that he was troubled because he was worried for me. And so I went to my room, and literally at 10 o'clock that night, there was a knock on the door. And when he knocked on the door, I have to be honest, I was a little bit concerned because there had been a murder in that hotel, like the month earlier. Some woman had been killed. So, you know, I went, I I had a big old crocodile knife, and I got the knife and kind of peeking out the door, and it was John. And he said, and I, I didn't realize this, John, he goes, I've got this brother named Anthony, and he's willing to go with you. And I said, Anthony, you know where we're going? He goes, yeah, I know where we're going. And I said, you know how dangerous? He goes, yeah, I know how dangerous it is. Well, he was willing to go with me. I said, Anthony, I'm going to leave at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning. And if you're not here, I'm going to leave without you. Now, guys, I was actually shocked because he actually showed up. I mean, Ugandan time is kind of like Calvary Chapel time. You never nearly know when they're going to show up, you know. But sure enough, 5 o'clock in the morning, he was there. And I go, Anthony, do you know the way to southern Sudan? He goes, yeah, I know the way. Well, 45 minutes after we lo- left our hotel, we drove past the front of the hotel again. And I said, Anthony, I don't think you know the way to Southern Sudan. He goes, no, I made one mistake, and that was the one he made. Well, guys, we finally get to that dirt road, and Anthony was sharing about his life. He had come down that road a year early. There was a military convoy. They had three buses, and they had military vehicles in front and back, and they were driving in the middle of the night. And he said, the first thing that we knew was an RPG hit our bus and exploded. And he said, it hit right in the center of the bus. It blew up. He said, people were on fire. The bus was on fire. He said, machine gun fire was coming in from every direction. And uh, and him and another guy opened the back door of the bus, and they just took off into the bush. And he said, you could hear people dying and everything. And he, he said, we ran about a half a mile in the bush. We came up over this little berm, and we ran into a full grown male lion. And the male lion got the other guy, and he ran off. He could hear the lion killing the guy, but there was nothing he could do about it. And so the moment we hit that road, he was Pentecostal, and he started speaking in tongues as loud as he could for about the next 45 minutes. And after about 45 minutes, I said, Anthony, if you don't shut up, (laughs) it's not the LRA that's going to kill you, brother. And so... We're going up there. Now, guys, there's no gas stations. You're in the middle of nowhere. So we get to this uh, 
<clears throat> the little village called Pasquatch, and we need to get diesel fuel. And we purchased diesel fuel. What I didn't know is they'd water down the diesel fuel. Now, when we would drive down these dirt roads, guys, it would tear our vehicles to pieces, but we would drive 50, 60 miles, 50, 60 miles an hour on dirt roads. And the reason why is because the rebels watch for you. And if they see you coming at a distance, they'll intercept you. But if you're going 50, 60 miles an hour, they normally can't get you. Well, a few minutes after we leave Pasquatch, I can't get the vehicle to go over 20 miles an hour. It's supposed to be a 45 minute drive. It takes me three and a half hours to get to the next city, which was called Arua. <clears throat> and that was where we were gonna spend the night. And we get to Arua and uh, they had a guest house there that you could rent, the only guest lodge. And I was exhausted. And I remember that I went in and we had dinner and I went into my room and I laid down my head. It was probably about seven o'clock at night. And at about 7.05, the disco started. How they have a disco in the middle of the jungle, I have no idea of the African bush. But the music just starts blasting, and it's outside my door, and it goes literally till about 5 o'clock in the morning. And about 5 o'clock or 4.30, the music went off, and I think I fell asleep about 4.30. My alarm goes off a half an hour later, and guys, I'm exhausted. And uh, I had called my mission director, Gary, and I said, Gary, I said, uh, I don't know what to do about this vehicle. Now, I was not a mechanical person. I didn't know anything about engines. And I said, uh, I said, I don't know if we're going to go another. The next 17 or 18 miles that we were traveled, three people had been shot that week on that road alone. Uh, one was killed, two were wounded. One of them was a relative of an Anthony's. And uh, I, I said, you know, uh, we can't outrun any rebel patrol. And I said, I don't know what to do. And he goes, Wes, he goes, you're going to have to make the decision. I can't tell you what to do. And so I got out of, I got up at five in the morning. I walked outside. It was light outside. And I walked outside and I sat down on a log and I go, Lord, I honestly don't know what to do. I said, wisdom, I would go back to Kampala and get the vehicle fixed, but it's going to take at least two weeks. Well, we were, news, we were news, losing nine to 11, 12 people a day were dying of starvation. And so if I go back, we're talking about at least another 200 lives. And I sit down on, on this log and I open up my Bible. And again, guys, th this is only a couple times this has happened in my life. I didn't have a place I was looking at, but I opened my Bible and it fell to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And in chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Cast your bread upon the water, for after many days you will find it again. Now, guys, when I read this verse, it was like it came right off the pages at me. I knew God was trying to say something to me, but I had no clue to what this meant. Cast your bread upon the water, for after many days you will find it again. I mean, what does that mean? You throw a sandwich on the water, and a week later you get a wet sandwich, you know? And, but fortunately, there was a commentary in the bottom of my Bible, and it says, be adventurous like those who accept the risk of seaborne trade. Do not always play it safe. And what they're talking about is in the time of old, if you wanted to make a living, you had to sell across the seas and the ocean to trade. Now, there was a risk of your ship sinking and dying, but if you didn't do it, you couldn't make a living. And that's exactly what the verse said. You can't always play it safe. Well, the end of the story is, of course, we got there. We didn't get ambushed. And we carried out the operation. We're able to save thousands of lives. And uh, this is what I want to share with you guys is that, as the word does say, if you diligently seek me, you will find me. Guys, if you're serious about the Lord, God is going to be serious with you. He's going to speak to your heart. The Lord is looking for people that have a heart after God. The Bible says, I look to and fro across the earth to find a man or a woman that has a heart after me. Uh, in my experience on the mission field, I probably get nine women applications for every male that comes. Men don't have a heart to minister. They don't like hardship. I'm amazed at what so many women are willing to do for the gospel. And I think it speaks very much of the times that we're living in. We're teaching men to be effeminate, to be soft, to be weak. Men were not designed to be that way. We were never supposed to be like this. But because of it, it's really affecting the world. And, you know, I've had people tell me, when I was on the mission field once, I had a, 
a woman that was pastoring in a certain area. And a, a Calvary guy came up to me and said, Wes, you got a woman doing man's ministry. And I go, you're right. And I said, and as soon as you can get a man over here to do it, I will replace them. But I will not, not have someone share the gospel because we can't get a man to come to this part of the world. And the truth is, is nobody ever did come. Never everybody did. And that woman did a great job of leading people to Christ. Um, you know, the Bible tells us that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. Guys, the Bible also tells us that the footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. It says that God guards men in his footsteps. And I really, I have learned to really not only trust that, but really believe it in a very deep way. When I got out of the United States Marine Corps, and, and guys, I had a lot about my age when I was in the 10th grade. I joined the United States Marine Corps. I volunteered for combat duty in Vietnam, and I wanted to go fight. I was a pretty highly trained soldier. I was a competitive shooter and my coach had said to me, Wes, you are so good with weapons, I think you could shoot the Olympics. And I said, I don't want to shoot the Olympics, I want to shoot other people, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the way I was. And, uh, but, I, but, you know, I, I got out of the Marine Corps, I spent five years in the Marine Corps, and I got out, and I was still only 21 years old, so it tells you how long I was, how young I was. I wanted to go to Rhodesia and become a soldier of fortune. Fortunately, Christ got a hold of my life, and it changed everything about me. But guys, one of the things I found out, and it's been just within the last few years, when I was going to Calvary Chapel back then, there was a young lady that was in my church. And at that time in my life, I literally thought she was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. I really did. I thought she was stunning. She loved the Lord. She was very sweet. She was about two or three years older than me, and... and uh, she actually wrote me this seven-page letter and there a lot of other things that happened, but God just blinded my eyes. I did not have a clue that that woman was interested in me. I would find out 30, 40 years later that she wanted to be my girlfriend. Now, the reason I'm sharing that with you, had I known that knowledge, the chances of me marrying her were probably 100%. <laughs> you know, I thought she was amazing. I would have probably married her. But then the life that God called me to, I probably would have never accomplished. I would have never gone to the mission field. I would have got married. I would have had a family. And I'm sure it would have been a nice life. But it was not the life that God called me to. And I think it's very important as believers that we give our lives to the Lord. And we not only give them to him, we say, Lord, we want you to order our footsteps. We want you to be in charge of leading us and guiding us and directing us in the small things of the world. And when we do that, God really works in a very powerful way to minister to us. I think we're going to end up having to continue this next week, guys. Um, let me see. Yeah, we're out of time. But next week we'll get into it and we'll try to finish this study here. But what I want to encourage you over the next week as you go home, we're racing towards eternity. We're racing towards it. You know, they just passed a law in Spain this last week that people can have sex with animals. Now, why you need to pass a law for that, I don't know. I wouldn't think anybody would want to admit to it. But what it tells us is the time that we're headed towards a time of great perversion. And what do you want your life to be? What do you want to do with it? See, we're running out of time, and if you're saving for the American dream, you may save and still not get to do it. But guys, on the other side of eternity, all that's going to be remembered is what was done for Jesus Christ. They're not going to remember what kind of car you owned, what, how big your house was, or how wealthy you were. All that will be remembered is how you lived your life for Jesus Christ. And I believe that the Lord wants the church to absolutely fanatically sell out. We don't train our men to be successful in ministry. We train them to die so that others might live, so that others might know of the great hope of the gospel. Just two weeks ago, we lost our 71st chaplain that was killed in action. We've lost 71 men in the service of Christ in Africa. But guys, all of their lives counted 
They had great meaning. Now, I doubt that God will call you guys to a war zone. God works within your gifts. I knew that I was going to be a soldier from the time I was six years old. And I used to remember when I was a child thinking, Lord, how am I going to use my gift? I mean, I'm a, I'm a soldier. I, I'm, I'm not a theologian. I'm not really a pastor. I'm a soldier. And I remember just praying one day and saying, Lord, I'm going to take the gifts you've given me and use them to the best of my ability. Now, I don't know how that's going to look. I don't know how to make that, put that together. But I'm going to just trust you to do it. And guys, it's another whole story of how God called me out of Russia to South Sudan. I never wanted to go to South Sudan. But the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's a promise from the Lord. I never thought Africa would be the joy of my heart, but it is. In our ministry, we have a lot of former special forces. I have one CIA agent that's on staff with me, former CIA. I have one former FBI on staff. And guys, all of these people could go out and make a considerable amount of money somewhere else in the world. Luke, who's on my staff, speaks fluent Arabic in multiple dialects. He's tested at genius level because he's got five other languages under his belt. Shannon Spann, Mike, husband Mike Spann, was the first CIA officer killed in Afghanistan back in 2001. She can call anybody in the world, any news station, and they'll interview her. CNN, Fox, anybody, they want to hear from her. They have these skills that they could go out and market to the world and make a tremendous amount of money. But one of the things that I love about them is they realize this is all wood, hay, and stubble. The things of this world will pass away but what is done for Jesus Christ will last for all of eternity.